All right, I'd like to start by telling you about the last time that I cried, which was about five minutes before the conference started. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It was, uh, it was several months ago when I was strapped to a machine with a bunch of scientists watching me. So you can imagine a bunch of scientists watching you strapped to a machine, and they tried to make me cry. And how they did it is by making me watch YouTube videos. And the one that worked, the one that did it, uh, was this one, this little screenshot of it. It's about a father who gets up in the morning and, uh, and his two kids are having breakfast. He kisses his wife, says hi to his kids. Uh, the, the little kid is like, hi, dad. And the teenage daughter is like, whatever. And, uh, and he has this new camera. Turns out this is a, a TV commercial. Uh, he has this new camera from HP and he, he takes a selfie with his daughter, you know, kind of the one that's being a bit of a pill. And she's like, ugh, and rolls her eyes. And then, uh, you know, he leaves for work and he's like, bye. And she's like, whatever, and goes off. So uh, during the day, she opens up her lunchbox. And in the lunchbox is the little photo that, uh, that her dad took with her, a little Polaroid looking photo. And she covers it up so that her friends don't see. And uh, dad comes home later that afternoon and, uh, you know, says hi to his son, says hi to the daughter. She's got headphones in, she ignores him. And he goes and he walks into their room, his kid's room, and he looks around at the signs that his kids are growing up, especially his little girl who's now a teenager and you know, she has a vanity and she has makeup and he's just like, ah, and you can sort of see the weight of you know, what it's like to be this dad and realize that, you know, that things are changing. And he kind of sits down feeling kind of heavy uh, on, the, there's bunk beds, and he sits down on the bottom bunk, which turns out is the daughter's, and he, he just lays down and when he looks up, he sees on the ceiling of the bunk bed Photo after photo, selfie after selfie that he's taken with her since she was a little girl, including the one from this morning that she's already put up uh, at the top of uh, uh, where she, what she sees right before she goes to sleep at night. And, uh, and at this point, I started crying, and I tried to hide it, but the scientists were like, aha, we see on your chart here <laughs> that you had an emotional reaction to this. And so this little chart... What it's measuring is, uh, is the vagus nerve, which is a nerve that goes between your brain and your heart. And you get variations in the rhythm of this nerve when your brain produces a neurochemical called oxytocin, which until for 100 years, we thought that oxytocin just had something to do with uh, childbirth. Your brain makes a lot of it when you're a new mother. Uh, but recently, in the last 10 years, they've learned that oxytocin, it turns out, is the chemical our brain makes when our brain wants us to empathize with someone. And during this journey of this, uh, this story, there were little spikes where I felt my heart went out for this, uh, to this father. And then at the end, when sort of the big reveal, when I realized that uh, his daughter really does love him and, and he realizes that too. And even though I'm not a dad, I wanted to give this guy a hug at the end of this, uh, this video. So why am I telling you this? Well, the first thing you see when you walk into the, the office, uh, my office in New York City, is this quotation here on the wall. It's an ancient Native American proverb. It says, those who tell the stories rule the world. And we have it there for a reason. Uh, part of what my company does is we help other companies tell stories. Uh, and the reason this is here is because I believe that there's something very fundamentally human about storytelling. And I want to connect this to the theme today uh, with customers and, and building our brands and our companies. Uh, by telling a couple of stories and then giving a few examples of companies we work with. So two stories uh, that I love telling. The first one is about a, a fellow writer. So I, I started my career as a writer named Jacques and a beggar he came across one day uh, when he was walking along the road in France where he lived. So he came across this beggar and for whatever reason this day Jacques decided to stop and, uh, and say hello. And he said, how's it going? And the, the beggar kind of motioned in his direction and, and Jacques observed that he was blind. And he said, well, it's not going very well. People pass by, they don't put any money in my hat. Uh, I'm blind and uh, you know, this sucks. Will you kind sir give me some money? And Jacques said, well, I'm a poor writer. Uh, so perhaps I can actually do something else. Uh, maybe I can rewrite your sign for you. And his sign said something simple like I'm blind, please help. Uh, a little advertisement. And, uh, and so the blind man said, by all means, rewrite my sign. I don't care. And uh, so he flipped the cardboard over, wrote a new sign, and went about his day. And uh, a few days later, Jacques was walking down the same path, came across the same blind man, and decided to ask the same question. How's it going? And this time, the blind man, his attitude was completely different. He said, my hat fills up three times a day. People have been so kind, so generous to me. Thank you, thank you for what you wrote on my sign. 
And what he wrote was this. He wrote, spring is coming, but I won't see it. So hang on to that story. I want to tell you probably my favorite story in the world. Uh, it's about Ryan Gosling and me. So I don't know how many of you know Ryan Gosling, but if you don't, here he is. Beautiful man. Uh, I feel like one day I'm going to run into him and he's, he's going to say, you're that creep that's been talking about me. Uh, but Ryan Gosling, a few years ago, I did not care at all about Ryan Gosling. At all. Until one day I was at a conference that was pretty boring, and it was boring enough that I was scrolling through Wikipedia at random on my phone. Those things where you click on the link, you click on the next link, and I'm le learning about wormholes and science and whatever. Somehow I end up on the Wikipedia page for Ryan Gosling. And I don't know how many of you know the story of Ryan Gosling, but according to Wikipedia, it goes something like this, that little Ryan Gosling, when he was a kid, he grew up in a very sad childhood. Uh, he grew up in Canada, which is not the sad part. The sad part is that his father was a traveling salesman, and they moved so often that he never made any friends. And then when he was quite young, his parents split up, and he stayed with his mom. His mom had to work, so he stayed at home alone watching television. And he loved television uh, in part because that television was his only friend. He would go to school where he was bad at making friends because he moved so much, and the kids would bully him. And he was little, and he was, it was hard for him to fight back. One day, things came to a head, uh, when he brought knives to school and started throwing them at the bullies because he had been watching Rambo, which was his favorite movie, which he watched while his mom was at work. And uh, little Ryan had all sorts of problems. He didn't learn how to read until he was 12 years old. He was diagnosed with ADHD. He had all sorts of problems, but he was a cute kid, and he was very passionate about television. And so when the Mickey Mouse Club came to town, he begged his mom to let him go audition for the Mickey Mouse Club. And, uh, and he was kind of a ham, and, and uh, they loved him, and so they let him in but his mom couldn't afford to move to Orlando, Florida with him, so he went by himself, and this is the craziest part of the story, he gets adopted by Justin Timberlake's mom. She becomes his legal American guardian, and he learns to read, he learns to act, he's on the Mickey Mouse Club, and then he becomes Ryan Gosling. So I read this Wikipedia entry, and suddenly I feel like I wanna go see some of his movies. I'd never seen any of his movies. I never saw The Notebook. Uh, and the next time I saw a television commercial for uh, one of his movies, it was Gangster Squad, which is the opposite of a movie that I would like to see. I saw Ryan Gosling was in it. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go see it. And I watched it. It was great. He was the best part. So then I went and I watched The Notebook. I've now paid many movie tickets worth of, uh, of dollars to, uh, to see Ryan. And I feel like I love the guy. I feel like I have a relationship with him. <laughs> and again, he probably doesn't want to have a relationship with me. But these two stories illustrate something fundamentally uh, important and human about stories themselves, which is that great stories build relationships and great stories make us care. I didn't care about Ryan Gosling, now I feel like I have a relationship with him, just because I read the Wikipedia version of his story that made him a human being to me. People didn't care about the blind man, he was one of many things they ignored when they walked along the way until they could put themselves in his shoes, understand what it's like to be him as spring is coming and he can't see it. So, there's some pretty awesome research, scientific research, about this power of stories. Uh, research that, that they've done in America shows that storytelling can break down barriers and foster compassion during, between different groups of people. When you look at social movements that have been successful, they've happened because people have come together from all different stripes, all different kinds of groups to support another group. And they do that when they learn of the stories of the brave woman who refuses to give up her bus seat. Uh, those are the kinds of things that motivate people, inspire people to cross these barriers and help each other out. Some really cool research actually from New Zealand where they put school children in, uh, from different uh, social classes and, uh, and economic classes um, in story time together, uh, elementary school kids. And uh, they had them share stories about themselves, they had them read stories together, and basically the upshot of this study was these kids grew up to be less racist than their peers. They had more empathy and curiosity towards other people who were not like them, just because they had spent all this time sharing stories with each other when they were kids. So, we're programmed for stories. This is part of the phenomenon, I guess, of uh, what it means to be a human being. So this study that they did when they hooked me up to the, the brain machine, it actually was testing different kinds of stories, and what are the elements of stories that generate this drug, this oxytocin, that makes us care, that builds relationships with people. And it turns out that our brains are wired for this because part of how we survived, as, uh, as human beings, we have these sort of fragile bodies, relatively speaking, to the tigers and everything else, but these great brains, and we figured out that if we could 
group up together, we could then build things and protect ourselves and hunt and feed ourselves. And so it was advantageous to build relationships with each other. So around the same time that we developed the capacity to speak and to communicate, uh, we also developed this sort of affinity for stories, it turns out. As our brains were evolving, uh, turning dreams into things that we could, uh, we could articulate, we gathered around the campfire and we took this knowledge that we'd learned when we were out on the hunt and we compacted it into stories to help people remember and understand. And neuroscientists like to say that uh, neurons that wire together, or fire together, wire together. What that means is the more of your brain that's active when you experience something, the more your brain will remember it. And it turns out that stories are this great mechanism for doing that. Because when you hear a story, when you hear me talk about Ryan Gosling growing up as a little kid in Canada, you're imagining, you're filling in the gaps of this story. And so more of your brain is active. And probably after this session, you will remember that story more than you'll remember the contents of any one of my slides. So this was advantageous for us as humans surviving together. But it turns out that this little chemical, oxytocin, was also advantageous to us because we wanted to be able to know when someone or something came towards us, should we help it out? Is this going to be helpful for us to survive together, or should we be afraid of it? Are they going to come steal our woolly mammoth steak, or are we going to go hunt the mammoth together? And this, in part, uh, was, uh, was done, this ability to decide that we should empathize with someone, help them out when they're in trouble, was done because we learned about them, and we learned their story. We got the feeling that they were human like us. So why is this relevant to us? Well, it turns out when you look at history, the history of the businesses that have had historically the best relationships with their customers, they have typically been the businesses in the business of telling stories. We subscribed to the newspapers, the magazines, we trusted them, we have relationships with them because they give us stories, because the product was stories. And the rest of us with our businesses, we had to pay them to, uh, to put our message next to the stories that people were interested and cared about. I don't know if anyone noticed that Ryan's in there another time. Uh, and so here today, we're talking about how we can build better companies by listening to our customers. And I would posit that your brand, your company, is the sum of the stories that you tell or that other people tell about you. And customers today, because they have so much more information at their fingertips, because they can do so much more research than before, they do it. And they want to do, businesses, do business with companies they feel like they know. They want to do business with companies that care about the same things that they care about, uh, all things being equal, they'll choose the company that they feel more comfortable with. And this is a product of the stories that those companies tell or that are told about them. So we can be victims to stories or we can be purveyors of stories, and this can help us build our businesses. But this, the script has to flip a little bit. So uh, a few years ago, I did a study where, a uh, study, uh, sort of a, an election poll where I asked 3,000 Americans if you were to, gonna vote for the next president, and the two candidates were the Queen of England or J.K. Rowling, the author of Harry Potter, who would you vote for? And J.K. Rowling won by a landslide, even though she's a children's book author. And I asked these people in this poll to justify their answer, and the people who chose the children's book author over the monarch, over the woman who'd been in power in leadership her entire life, the majority of people who voted for J.K. Rowling said that they felt like they knew her better, and that's why they voted for her. Which if, you, if you think about other elections or other ways that we choose our leaders, we're more comfortable with the leaders that we feel like we know. We want to do business with people who at least we know what we're getting from them. Um, so the question becomes, how can we as businesses, as companies, as people who care about our customers, how can we tell the kinds of stories that build relationships and make people care? And there's, you know, there's a, a I have a couple quick diagrams. There's sort of some frameworks in general if you're thinking of this from a marketing perspective. Uh, you know, at the top, if you don't have any kind of relationship with someone, just like in real life, when you're getting to know someone, when you sit down at coffee, tell stories about things you care about that you think they care about too. Sort of the top of the funnel kind of idea. As you build more and more of a relationship, uh, tell, story, tell your story. Tell about yourself, why you're doing what you're doing. Tell stories of the people you care about, the customers you care about. And then as people feel more comfortable and they've built more of a relationship with you, then you can try to sell them something. And one of the best ways to sell people something is to get them to care about that something by telling the story of that something. Very similar to that first coffee date versus that dinner date versus you've now been dating for a while and you can reveal kind of what you want uh, in life and, and your insecurities and all of that and people can love you anyway because they've built that relationship. It's sort of similar. Uh, another way you can flip this is, uh, is kind of when you're really getting into, getting into marketing, 
telling stories that uh, rise above the noise, that get people's attention, that get them to actually uh, focus on what you're saying in this hurricane of noise, using those stories to get people to follow you and to develop a regular kind of interaction with you, and then using those stories to get people to pay attention to the essential content, so to speak, to learn about your product and, and you on your website. Uh, but I want to tell, I guess, three quick case studies of one for each of these kinds of things of how companies that, that I've seen, and, and in one case my own, uh, use customer feedback and listening to the customer as a way to tell better stories in each of these categories. Uh, and the, the first one starts with, uh, I don't know how to say this exactly, a pedophile? Um, so it starts with Kevin Spacey. Uh, so I don't know how many of you know the, the story of House of Cards, um, but Netflix, uh, when they, they started deciding to create original content, uh, they had a kind of a choice like any television production company uh, does of uh, what are the stories that we want to tell, what's the, what's the kind of television we want to make that people will actually pay attention to. And, uh, and House of Cards was their first big bet. It was the first show that they made that was original. Before that, Netflix just licensed movies and television shows. And, uh, and I love this example so much, even though uh, Kevin Spacey. Um, but what happened is Netflix, unlike other television companies, other, unlike NBC or CBS or any of these uh, television companies, they had more data, more information about what people like to watch than anyone else. So if you're NBC, you know roughly how many people tune in, uh, but you don't know what they watch next. You don't know if they got up and left. You don't know if they hit pause. Uh, Netflix knows all of that. So Netflix can tell whether you finish the TV show or the movie. They can tell if you hit pause. They can tell if you rewind, what parts you rewind to. They can tell if you watch it again. They can tell what you watch next. And they can build this sort of library of your behavior. And what Netflix noticed is that uh, some of the biggest sort of patterns were that people who watched Kevin Spacey movies watched a lot of Kevin Spacey movies. They were big fans of his as an actor. They also noticed that David Fincher, the director, that people who watched Fincher movies tended to watch lots of Fincher movies. And uh, they also noticed that there's this little known TV show in, uh, in Britain called House of Cards, and people who started that show would finish all the way to the end. Not many people saw it, but everyone who did start would finish all the way to the end. So Netflix basically built a Venn diagram that said, let's make a new version of House of Cards with Fincher directing and Spacey starring, and this became House of Cards, and it cost them $100 million to produce, uh, which is very expensive for a television show. I think it may have been the most expensive ever at the time. And they paid it off in new Netflix subscriptions in four months, which is crazy. Uh, and so even though now Kevin Spacey has been kind of blacklisted and, and this data would show that people do not want to watch Kevin Spacey shows, Netflix has followed this pattern to create all sorts of other shows. This is How Orange is the New Black and Stranger Things, which is my favorite. They look at different segments of their audience, at what they like the most, what they engage with for the most time, and then they combine elements of those things that, that they like and basically manufacture new shows based exactly on what people want to see. And the upshot of this is that while two-thirds of network shows get canceled after the first season, which is often sad to some of us fans, only one-third of Netflix shows get canceled after the first season. So the technology and data that Netflix uses gives them double the advantage over all of their competitors, which is the kind of advantage that all of us would like uh, as we're building our brands, as we're doing our marketing, as we're building our products. And, uh, and so this is an example in kind of that blockbuster category of if you can hone in and compile the different things that your audience really loves, you can build something better that people will care about more and pay a lot of attention to. I watched all of Stranger Things in one setting. I think I used the bathroom once. Uh, and, uh, and that's the power of not just storytelling, but giving the audience what they want. Second example, this is a customer of ours uh, at Contently, Avocados from Mexico. Perhaps a, a little bit more uh, relatable to us who have businesses uh, than Netflix, which is massive. Avocados from Mexico, they, they grow avocados and they sell them around the world. Uh, they really want people to buy their avocados from Mexico. There's a lot of places that avocados grow, but they want you to buy them from here. And so that's kind of the, been their positioning. Um, and avocados are great. People who like them like them. But they wanted to expand the, uh, the market and the demand for their avocados. And so uh, their marketing strategy uh, basically was recipes for avocados 
and, uh, and hoping that, that you would then buy your avocados from them. They took a look at data with, uh, with some help from us and, and some of their other partners to look at what are the kinds of food stories uh, out there that are doing really well in social media. And I don't know if you, this chart is kind of hard to, to read right here, but basically a surprise, they discovered that the kinds of food stories that get shared the most are not the short recipes, they're the really long, really long uh, stories about whatever topic when it has to do with food. Uh, they, they also looked at data around, you know, what are the networks that, uh, that these stories get shared the most. If you're trying to expand the market, having people tell their friends the stories that you're, you're putting out there, it's a very organic, good way to do that. Um, and then they looked at the data on when are the most shares happening uh, by day of the week uh, among these categories of, of food products. And so they, they shifted their strategy that basically uh, emerged in having them have 10 times the engagement of the average person that came to their website to read you know, what before was just recipes, but turned into eventually a much bigger series. So they, they do this whole series with Mashable right now. They have an ebook that you can download, uh, an avocado ebook or guacamole ebook. They started doing this long form content because it turns out that if you are an avocado lover and, uh, and you like avocado recipes, you're trying to convince, I guess, your friends, your family, that this is a good idea, that avocados are good for you. Just sharing a recipe for making a salad is not as persuasive, doesn't make you look as good or as convincing as sharing this gigantic treatise on the benefits of avocados, it turns out. Uh, and so this helped them to get 10 times more engagement uh, by doing this kind of longer form, more thoughtful content. And it turns out that if you read 2,000 words worth about avocados, you're much more likely to build a relationship with the maker of those 2,000 words and buy your avocados from Mexico and not from Colombia. Uh, so this became part of the strategy of going sort of against the grain, but by looking at data from what people were sharing just on Facebook. Um, and it turns out I learned something new, is that avocado is not only a fruit, but it's a berry. Uh, I learned this from them. Uh, so technically, avocado is a berry, so the more you know. Uh, so the final uh, little story I want to tell is actually one that comes, uh, comes from me. So I have a, a new book that's coming out uh, this June that uh, I guess a lot of the, uh, the speakers and sponsors are giving away free things here. So I have a few free chapters that we're giving away through the app uh, for anyone that wants a preview of this. Uh, but it's, it's been kind of my life's work, nights and weekends and, uh, and uh, sabbatical over the last four years. It's about making the world better by, by working better together. Uh, but I have this book coming out. It's my product. It's my little small business that, uh, that I want to be successful. And my publisher wants me to sell lots of copies. And so I built a marketing plan around this. Uh, but the product itself, uh, I wanted to get feedback from my customers, my potential readers, on what's the most important thing to them. So I built this little, uh, this little page using some of our technology where I started sharing early chapters of the book with, uh, with different people, review re readers, with uh, you know, customers of mine, people who might be interested. So I'd share these little chapters, you put in your email address, and then I get to track how you're reading it. And so I can tell uh, in this chapter here that a lot of people are very interested in whatever's going on on this page over here. I forget, uh, you can't quite tell what page that is. Page 11? People are very interested in whatever this is, so I use this as feedback to uh, incorporate more of this to expand on this in, in this chapter. And then it turns out, uh-oh, that on page 21, people really just check out, and I think this was the part when I started talking about how I dislike Ronald Reagan or something, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, use this to basically optimize the actual content of my, uh, my book, chapter by chapter, so that I can deliver people the stories and the information and the education that they're actually looking for, not just what I want to give to them. And so this kind of, these three stories are, are just quick examples of this shift that I think is happening and needs to happen in business, which is that no longer can we simply tell the world what we want them to do, what we want them to hear, what we care about. We need to flip that. We need to ask the world what they care about, and then if that aligns with who we are and our values and, and, and what we care about, then give them that. And so this is where we get back to this, uh, this uh, brain science, is uh, the scientists that, that made me cry They've developed this new thing called the immersion band, which is basically this thing that you strap to your arm that can measure that vagus nerve. And they're starting to use it with uh, advertising companies, uh, with uh, agencies, and uh, when they make television commercials, to basically test different messages against each other to see which are uh, getting the most emotional response from people. 
And it turns out that oxytocin, this drug that builds relationships and makes us care, it's generated the most when we feel a positive social experience, when we feel a kindness for someone, and when we can activate more uh, human emotion, essentially, which is, uh, is not that surprising sounding, but now we can actually measure it. So instead of getting excited about what we care about, or we love our products, and we, because in part, we make money from them, and, and so we're gonna give those to you and, and convince you that you should buy them, now actual science can help us to know whether people care at all whether they care at all about our products or the message that we have around them or whether there's a better way to do this. They've started testing this with uh, charities. So different messages to get people to donate more money to charity. Uh, what are the kinds of stories that can help? They've started testing this with, uh, with campaigns to get people to quit uh, addictive drugs and, uh, and smoking and things like that. And I think this is gonna change the world. And I think that our businesses, if we're not paying attention to to this kind of thing, this new kind of data that we can get from customers will be passed by by businesses that do. Uh, so I want to end with one last story on that note of, of the human emotional power of stories and how that can change everything. Uh, because I think that it's not just about marketing messaging that we put out. But I think it's about storytelling can be woven into much more than that. So this guy here, his name is Doug. He uh, is a product designer at GE, and he was in charge a few years ago of redesigning the MRI machine, which is this thing here. So uh, MRI machine, very important piece of equipment, helps us uh, detect life-threatening problems, and, uh, and they needed to redesign it because it was old. And uh, so they redesigned the machine, made it beautiful and, uh, and much more elegant. Lots and lots of money poured into this project. So Doug, uh, he went to some hospitals to watch people interact with this new machine, watch the, the doctors and nurses and watch the patients. And, uh, and early on, after they started rolling out these, these machines, these test versions of the new MRI, he was in the hallway of a hospital one day and he saw this. He saw a little girl crying, like me, uh, saying, mommy, mommy, please don't make me go in the scary machine again. And it broke his heart because he was a father and he suddenly put himself in the shoes of some of his most vulnerable customers, vulnerable users of his product, and realized just how terrifying this machine he just made is. Uh, so you're a kid, you're small, there's all these strangers around you, they put a needle in your arm, put you on a board, take away your parents, and they put you in this Death Star that makes scary sounds, and you have to hold still for 20 minutes. That's awful, this is the most terrifying thing ever. Of course kids were crying when they had to go back in the machine. So Doug before, he was all excited, and then hey, he kind of looked like this. He's like, oh no. And he just spent tens of, this is supposed to be a GIF, tens of millions of dollars uh, redesigning this machine and realized that they had to scrap it. They had to go back and do something different. And so, you know, they took a look at the machine and they said, well, are we going to be out another several $10 million to, to redesign this machine, this experience, so that our patients don't hate it, so our users don't hate it. Uh, and, uh, and one day he was at home with his kids, uh, and before bedtime, or before he put them to bed, he would always read stories uh, with his kids. And he was having story time one night with his kids, and he had an idea that instead of spending tens of millions of dollars to, uh, to make a new, less scary MRI machine, what if instead they just painted it to look like a pirate ship? And what if the night before you went to get your MRI, your parents took home a storybook with you and you read about all the new friends you were gonna meet tomorrow on your pirate adventure. Marcella the monkey and Tina the toucan. And you read half of this story about the pirate adventure you're gonna go on. And then the next day, you go and you show up to the, the hospital and the doctors and nurses are dressed like pirates and they continue the story. And at one point during the story, you have to sneak past the bad pirates. And so you have to be real quiet and you have to lay down on the rowboat and the rowboat goes through and, and you go into the tunnel so you can get past the bad pirates and on the roof of the tunnel there's some stars and you can see Tina the Toucan is there hanging out with you and, uh, and then you get to the end and then the story continues and then you, you go home and your parents see the x-ray or whatever it is. Uh, so they did this. And it only costs a few hundred dollars to buy pirate costumes or repaint an MRI machine. And they went from kids saying, mommy, mommy, please don't make me go in the scary machine to can I go again? And they rolled out a whole series of these. There's a space adventure, which is the one I want to go on. Uh, and, uh, and they saved not only tons of money for the company, but they created an experience 
that changed people's attitudes. And kids' attitudes can be pretty hard to change, but, but they change from hate to love and enjoyment just because they wove story into the experience. So that's kind of what I want to end with is, is this, when we're talking about storytelling, we're talking about listening to customers, we're talking about building brands, I think that all of this that we're doing in business is bigger than just marketing, it's bigger than just business, and I think especially when we think about the stories that we're telling as companies and as human beings, stories are powerful. If you remember, a story turned someone who was not really human to me into a human being, and this can happen inside of our companies, it can happen between us and our customers, but this is how we can make the world a little bit better together. Story, a story made people unlock kindness. They made people generous, feel for someone that they would have ignored, someone who needed them. And I think because we need each other, we can use stories, not just for business, but to change everything about the way that we live and work and the way we do business. So I think we should do that. And thank you very much. Um, Shane's actually one of our hosts on the study tour, um, so thanks for hosting us in New York pleasure. when we come through and showing us inside your exciting organisation. Um, so okay, let's just go back just a little bit. So when we think about stories, are there any kind of rules around the central tenant of what makes a good story? Yeah, uh, I mean, I can talk about this for a long time. Don't. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> there's four things, I think, uh, that make for a story that captures people's, not just attention, but their hearts and minds. The first is familiarity, relatability. We care about stories that have some element that we can put ourselves into those shoes. So characters, even villains that we can relate to, uh, stories about people or about human-like things, so whether it's the robots on Star Wars, you actually care about them because you feel a sort of relatable connection, or whether Milo noticed the, the animals. Um, but you start with relatability, and then you move into novelty. A good story is going to activate, continue to activate new parts of your brain to make you pay attention. So you start in a place of familiarity, and then you go out on the adventure. Third thing is what I call fluency, which is basically the best storytelling doesn't make you have to think about the elements you don't have to think about the vocabulary words. You don't have to go look up in a dictionary. You don't have to ask your friend, what's going on, like during the movie. Uh, fluency, making it easier on the, the reader, the viewer, the person listening to your story is really important. It's why I did a study a few years ago about reading levels. And it turns out that the most popular writers in the world write at a much lower reading level than their peers for their subject matter. So Hemingway writes at a third or fourth grade reading level, depending on the book. Whereas I write at like an eighth or ninth grade reading level, in part, that's why Hemingway is so popular. Even smart people like when it's easy to get through a story. And then the fourth thing is tension. So uh, Aristotle talked about how uh, a great story establishes what is and what could be. And the gap between those two things is the story. And without that, you don't really have that interesting of a story. So if you think about boring love story is Jack and Jill met because they were next door neighbors and their parents were fine with them being friends and then they decided why not get married and they lived happily ever after. That's not a good story. But Romeo and Juliet's families hate each other. They're willing to die for each other. They do die for each other. That's an amazing story. Uh, so that tension, that gap between what you want and what could be and where you are now, uh, that's something that you can see play out in business and even kind of boring case studies. What makes that case study work is that tension between those two things. Um, but the best stories do that over and over and over and over and over again. So c can a brand harness that? Or is it what is brand just a word that then tells stories? Can the brand actually have a Romeo and Juliet to Darth I think so. Vader? Or, you know? So I think there's, yeah, there's two things there. There's, uh, you know, your brand is the sum of the stories that you're telling. So you're telling a, about a journey that you're making that you want your customers to make with you, right? And I imagine an icebreaker, that's a lot of how you've, sort of developed your brand. Um, but you're also telling individual stories about the things you care about, about your own people, and about your, your products. A lot of those, a lot of companies ask me and, and my colleagues about, well, we're a pest control company. No one cares about stories about pest control. But you have Unless customers. they've got pests. What? Yeah. <laughs> Unless they've got pests. Yeah. Uh, but there's actually a lot of stories that you can tell even in very boring industries because if you are thinking about relatability and novelty, uh, a lot of those categories are, are categories where uh, they're unfamiliar, but there's always human beings behind every product. 
and behind every kind of customer. And so finding those stories uh, of the human beings and what they're up against can help to get you to care about something that you would normally think of as a commodity. So if there's two pest control companies, but you learn about you know, the founding story of you know, the, the woman who started the pest control company and she was you know, living on the street when she did it and you know, mortgaged everything to do this or whatever, you're gonna care more about doing business with that company than you are about the, the company that just has these ads you know, on television or whatever. So finding the human beings that you can relate to and then kind of drawing out that tension in a lot of industries as well, especially in B2B. Uh, if you are in that industry, you care a lot. Um, versus you know, other people that, that aren't in the market for whatever you're doing, they won't care about your stories, but you can still find the, the tension in all of those. Um, and I, I think even the point about fluency is really important. Even if you're just doing kind of marketing and branding as usual, if you can make it dramatically easier for people to understand what you're trying to say, that itself gives you a leg up. And if we drop down from the brand level to the content level, um, you said something industry, interesting, interesting when you're talking about cadence. You said uh, be regularly present where your audience hangs out. So can you tell us a little bit about the where versus the what? So let's say we've got some great stories which have all those principles. Um, presumably where you tell those stories as opposed to waiting for them to come to your site. How do you discover where your potential cust customers are open to your types of stories. Yeah, I mean, I think this is maybe more than half the battle today. Um, I saw on your chart, channels was the, the last thing on, on your list. So I think that a lot of times we get the sequence backwards. We say, here's this message that we want, so now let's put it somewhere. I think it's actually more helpful to say, where is the audience that we want? Where are they and what do they want on that channel? And then back out the stories that you want to tell from there. So, I mean, you can kind of crudely put together, uh, you know, a map of kind of, if, if we're talking about the internet, for example, a map of the internet of say, you know, B2B, B2C, and then what's your goal? Branding or conversion, uh, you know, uh, people buying or whatever. And in each of those quadrants, you can say, people who are in the mood to buy something in the B2B segment, they're hanging out in these places, LinkedIn or whatever, maybe not LinkedIn, right? But you can kind of map out the, the general world there. Then you can also look at data from these social platforms especially, um, or you know, from Google, and figure out where am I gonna be wasting my efforts because no one on Pinterest is ready to you know, buy a server or whatever. Uh, so you can kind of eliminate that and then you can look at the data of what people are engaging with on those channels. There's also, I mean, you can get really deep into this. You can look at what are people engaging with on certain channels, uh, but not on other channels. Where's the white space, basically? So people on LinkedIn care about all of these things. Some of those same people are on SlideShare or wherever, but no one's talking about these things. So then just port over those uh, topics, concepts, ideas um, to that other channel, especially in new and emerging channels. But I, I think that we, you know, the, the sequence of doing the work of telling stories is you create the story, then you connect with the audience, then you look at what happened and you fix it, you optimize, right? But the planning for that should be the opposite. It should be, where's the audience, then what should you create? So when we think about using data to work out if you're doing a good job or not, so you, know, you get a, what you think is a great story, you put it where you think your customers are hanging out. Um, can you talk about what type of data is most useful to listen to? And you know, what did you do when you got to page 11 and people weren't interested because mm. of Ronald Reagan? So, so what to do? <laughs> yeah, uh, all right, so there's two questions there. Do you there. just make an 11 page chapter or do you rewrite it or? Uh, you dig you into what, I mean, precedent? in that case it was pretty dramatic. It was like everyone stepped away at this point, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, I mean, I think that sample of that screenshot was something like 20 people, but if all 20 people leave at that point, you know, something's going on, and it's because I shifted gears into a new kind of topic that was not, I guess, germane to what everyone was reading it for. So, uh, you know, I changed the transition into that topic to something that, that was more relevant, essentially. Um, so, I mean, I think there's, there's kind of two ways to look at it. You don't change the world by following the trends, right? If everyone else is being successful doing one thing, 
then you can maybe build a business, you can maybe make some money, but you're not going to be innovative necessarily by following. So data can be helpful for you know, kind of just making sure you have your bases covered. Uh, I think the more interesting thing is looking at data to look for things that are going to happen. I guess, where is the ball going to move? What are the trends that aren't sort of fully actualized yet? Uh, so kind of being, using data to predict where people are going to be interested in the future. Uh, that's helpful, but I, I think that... So does that require a creative leap to just push out different ideas and see what sticks? Yeah, I think it's two things. I think it requires uh, paying more attention to momentum than to sort of absolute interest in something. So growth in interest in something versus just absolute interest. The other thing is, is I think that uh, you should reserve some amount of your efforts for experimenting. Um, so, you know, throwing things out, testing them, kind of this horse race analogy. You put 10 pieces of content out there, the two that do the best, you then, uh, you know, you double down on and you do more like that. But one or two out of those 10 horses every time should be something very different, very novel and experimental that if that horse wins, then suddenly everyone is going to sort of follow it. It's kind of like the guy that first jumped over the high jump bar backwards, right? In the 70s, everyone was jumping over the high jump bar forwards. And then this guy made it to the Olympics and won the gold medal by jumping over backwards. And everyone was like, you can't do that. But it was not against the rules. And so next Olympics, everyone did that. And he didn't even make it because it turns out he was just good at the new technique. So there's kind of that element at play too. You know, if you can invent the next thing, you can figure out the next thing, then people will follow that. So you have to be in this sort of constant process of experimenting. And I think that's also where making sure that you're staying true to yourself in this process and you know, telling the kinds of stories that you care about very deeply, even if data is not telling you that, as a component of your, I guess, your branding strategy. So final, final question. When you think about what you do in-house as part of your core team, maybe part of your marketing department or your storytelling department, or maybe distributed across the business versus outsourcing to an expert agency such as your own or uh, something different, you know, maybe a design agency even. What are the trade-offs between doing it in-house versus outsourcing? Yeah, uh, I mean, there's a few. I think that you need in-house to have someone who owns your core and your story, right? That's overseeing that, whether you're working with partners or not. Um, it's not going to really feel to people real if, uh, if you're just throwing it out to someone else who's not you, who doesn't have. I think the, the emotional sort of connection that we build comes from our own passion and, and how we actually feel, right? Um, so I think to some degree you want to have, uh, you know, at least that core in-house. If you're working with partners, I mean, so we do a lot of work, and we work with a lot of big companies, and the ones that are most successful are the ones that they're using us for kind of the legwork, not for the thinking, right? We can help them with data and provide insights for helping them to make decisions, but we can't, I guess, make their purpose. So authenticity is key? Yeah, I, I think that that's really important. And I think also we're in a world now where it doesn't necessarily matter if the people who are you know, shooting video for you or, or writing articles for you are in your office or some other part of the world, but uh, as long as what they're doing connects to what you care about, that's okay. Uh, but it's really hard to kind of outsource the keeper of your purpose to some agency. So. Cool. Shane Snow, thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome.